Order. Order. Uh, good morning and welcome to the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs uh, Committee. Uh, today we are uh, taking evidence on the uh, Elections Bill, which will receive its second reading uh, this afternoon um, in the Commons. The Bill is wide-ranging in its ambition and proposes uh, changes to the way that elections uh, take place uh, in our democracy. Our witnesses uh, today are in two panels, and the committee is very grateful for them giving of their time and expertise to us. And I'm going to ask uh, the members of the first panel to introduce themselves to the record, please, uh, starting, if I may, with Dr. Jessica Garland. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Jess Garland. I'm Director of Policy and Research at the Electoral Reform Society. And Professor Toby James. Good morning. I'm Toby James, Professor of Politics and Public Policy at the University of East Anglia and Deputy Director of the Electoral Integrity Project. And Angela Kitching. Good morning. I'm Angela Kitching. I'm the Head of External Affairs for AGK, the Older People's Charity. And Helen Mountfield, QC. Uh, if we, uh, maybe maybe muted. Sorry, um, I'm Helen Mountfield. Uh, I am a barrister at Matrix Chambers and I'm the principal of Mansfield College in Oxford and I've practiced in election law over a number of years and I was a legal advisor on Lord Hodgson's report into um, third party funding. Thank you. And Peter Stanion, please. Good morning, I'm Peter Stanion, Chief Executive of the Association of Electoral Administrators. Thank you. First question from me, if I may. Various reviews and, and reports have uh, called for uh, urgent reform and consolidation of electoral law. Um, to what extent does this bill address these concerns? <clears throat> if I could go first to Helen Mountfield, please. <clears throat> um, I, I'm afraid I don't think it, it does get to the heart of the matters that have been identified. There, there are genuine problems and they have been picked up in a number of reports. So the Law Commission has emphasised the lack of clarity and the archaic structure of um, election law and the lack of transparency in the mechanisms for challenging elections through petitions. There are concerns, including those identified in Lord Hodgson's 2016 report and the, by the Committee on Standards in Public Life on lack of transparency in election funding, um, inadequacy of sanctions and the lack of teeth um, for the uh, Electoral Commission. And of course the Information Commissioner's Office has also expressed concerns about data-driven and, and digital campaigning and lack of clarity on use of databases and called for cross-party work and a statutory code of practice on that. Um, but unfortunately, because this is, a, I think, a very important and urgent issue, um, because here, as in other places, faith in democracy is waning and we need to shore it up, um, this bill doesn't really address those central um, questions. Um, and it doesn't identify those dangerous and destructive problems which have been identified, although it does address some um, issues that do need to be addressed, for example, um, multiple proxies. I think that's, that's uncontroversially a good thing to, to stamp down on that. Um, but there are at least three uh, respects in which this bill um, will seriously undermine trust in democracy, and I know we'll discuss them later and in, uh, other people will discuss them in another session, but the real problems, it seems to me, um, are firstly um, that on the pretext of solving a problem of voter personation, which is a tiny and insignificant issue, um, it risks making the electoral process less accountable by suppressing millions of votes in ways which may be politically uh, significant. Secondly, um, the bill introduces new restrictions and bureaucratic barriers to making smaller donations um, and links between political parties and organisations without addressing the real problems caused by very large external donations and the lack of sanctions. And of course, the, the elephant in the room is that the really big example of that is the funnelling of 675 thousand pounds just before so just before the um referendum the eu referendum to a tiny organization called believe um as a, and, and a fine which arose from that of sixty one thousand pounds so um that's a real problem um, and the third very serious problem with this bill is um the proposals for um effectively curbing a supposedly politically independent 
Electoral Commission by suggesting that it will have to have regard to a statement of electoral priorities set by the government of the day, which is a player in the game. And yes, that's going to be subject to ratification by Parliament and the Speaker's Committee, um, but that nonetheless brings in the players as part of the referee mechanism um, and removes the Electoral Commission's power um, to prosecute, doesn't bring in adequate powers to investigate, which is one of the suggestions that have been, uh, has, has been made. And I think it's very dangerous to the actual and the perceived political independence of the regulator, which is intended to uphold the integrity of elections and our parliamentary process, um, if one player, and it may be a different player, um, depending on who's won the election, but if one player gets to inform the basis upon which that's done, um, and it corro corrodes trust in democracy, which is already fragile, uh, I think it does that in two ways. Firstly, by creating the impression that electoral fraud is a widespread problem, even though our system of casting votes is one of the safest in the world, um, and creating doubts where there need be none, and secondly, by undermining the independence um, of the regulator um, in circumstances where this looks particularly like an attempt to clip um, its wings. Thank you very much indeed. If I could pose the same question uh, in terms of the extent to which you feel those, these concerns are addressed by the bill to Jess Garland, please. I don't have a great deal to answer that other than to say that obviously one of the reasons for simplifying and rationalising the law as the Law Commission's recommended was that those that are taking part in running elections really know where they stand. And I, I don't see that um, simplicity or, or, or dealing with that complexity here. In, in many ways, I think this bill does add to the complexity for those taking part in elections, particularly, as Helena says, around the voter ID, um, voter ID proposals. And of course, part four uh, around third party campaigning has caused some concern amongst charities and campaigners that this could be like the Lobbying Act, causing confusion around election time, which of course could be any time now, um, around what they are allowed to do and, and what they what they can't do. So, so I don't see those aims of, of rationalisation and streamlining here. Thank you. And uh, same question, if anything, to add to Toby James, if I may. Thank you. I very much agree with your comments. Um, the, the bill uh, does not focus on the main areas that have been flags of concern. Uh, the Electoral Integrity Project runs evaluations of elections worldwide and has done since 2012, showing the areas of strengths and weaknesses. Um, and the bill, in many respects, misfires in, in that way. Uh, it focuses on, on um, voter fraud, it focuses, focuses on the wrong areas, such as voter fraud, where that is not a problem. Uh, it, it will actually worsen the problem with fragmented, convoluted electoral law. It's going to make elections harder to deliver um, because, um, because of all these complexities and are much more difficult to understand for citizens as well. Um, on top of this, you've got issues such as people not possibly not being able to cast their votes um, because of the voter ID restrictions and the government taking greater control over electoral authorities and the electoral process, uh, which is very much the wrong direction at a time where globally uh, we are seeing an age of kind of democratic backsliding. So there are grave concerns here. I think the main thing I would stress is that despite this, there are some, some positive aspects and there's really a very strong opportunity to make some amendments uh, to this bill to, um, to address some, some of those problems. And I would urge the committee uh, uh, to do that. Thank you. If I go to Angela Kitching next, um, do you think the government's consultation process has been sufficient in terms <clears throat> of the uh, length of time and, and, and the levels of um, engagement from your perspective, from your organisation? Thank you. We've um, had the opportunity to engage with the Cabinet Office and with Cabinet Ministers over proposals around particularly the presentation of ID and the running of elections for some years now. So I think we feel organisationally that actually they have been very open to uh, speaking to us about these issues. Unfortunately, what we haven't really seen is them change their proposals as a result of that consultation. So we've been raising very consistently problems that other people will have engaging with election when they have to present particular forms of ID and, and throughout the pilot um, of, of this uh, proposals uh, that's happened. We, we've found that there's been very patchy engagement on the ground and very little demographic information collected to say who is actually affected by these proposals. So our concerns really are that they don't have the evidence to understand the impact of the proposals that they're making here. 
um, rather than that they're not open to talking to people. Thank you. Um, Helen Meltfield. Yes, um, my real concern is that this is very constitutionally and democratically significant legislation and it's being put through without a white paper, without a process of um, cross-party deliberation in the course of a pandemic um, when uh, there is a, a, a background and a context of um, the, the, the minister who is being proposed to be put in charge of the Electoral Commission, being somebody who is recently feels very strongly that he's been unfairly treated by the Electoral Commission as a director of vote leave. And um, it's, I think, inexplicable that this is being rushed through without the opportunity for proper debate or an attempt to build cross-party consensus. And that feeds a perception, and it may be a wrong perception. This may be a sticking plaster solution to some problems and not others, but the, certainly a perception that that is being done for narrow and short-sighted reasons of perceived uh, political um, advantage. And we do have to ask, in terms of trust in the political process, what does that look like? Surveys across the democratic world show that trust in democracy is in a weaker state than it's ever been, and for decades. And there really is a danger of weakening respect and trust in the democratic process if this is seen as cunning wheezes, because if parliamentarians are treating democracy as cunning wheezes, then we shouldn't be surprised if citizens disengage from the democratic process and its players. So I think it's really extraordinarily important in this context to go by the rules of the game, the rules of the parliamentary game, in terms of setting out what proposals are, why they're being proposed, why, if independent regulators like the ICO and the Electoral Commission are making recommendations, why those are or not, are not being advanced by the government of the day, and an attempt to be seen to be fair. Thank you. On this topic, Toby James, do you have something to add? Yes, just to add that there is a long-standing uh, tradition within Westminster uh, to actually hold a speaker's commission when you have a major piece of electoral legislation being proposed. Uh, and this convention goes back you know, throughout much of the 20th century. The idea would be that the prime minister of the day calls a, a speaker's commission. You have a cross-party talks about the composition of the bill and other actors such as you know, Age UK and other third sector um, organisations are able to have their input into this. Um, with Transparency International actually wrote to the speaker uh, and, and encouraged the speaker to, to undertake that approach. Uh, but the response was because the prime minister of the day had not called a uh, speaker's commission, it was not possible uh, to do so. Um, and I think this is really problematic on the basis that, uh, as we've heard, uh, it can risk um, confidence in a democratic process. It, it could lead to a, a government um, either making changes that could advantage itself um, or at least giving that perception um, of that. I mean, we really shouldn't, you know, if we go back to January um, and those events that we saw in terms of the Capitol building, um, the unthinkable was happening in, in American democracy. So we have to be really careful with, with, the, with the electoral process and something like um, a cross-party approach to a Speaker's Commission is absolutely uh, the way forward to go. Thank you. Um, Ronnie Cowan, please. Yeah, thanks, Chair. <clears throat> We've covered this to a degree, but looking at the administration, the conduct of the elections, and related to Dr. Garner, the Professor James, I'm looking at this voter ID. Is there any good reason at all why we should introduce a voter ID? Well, I can start. Um, there is no evidence of widespread impersonation fraud. Um, the government has yet to provide a justification on the basis of it being a problem, and that's something that the um, Joint Committee on Human Rights also concluded last week. Um, so, so no, the evidence of impersonation isn't there. Um, so, so it, it's hard to see um, something in the data that, that could justify it. Absolutely, I would agree with that. If you look at all the academic evidence that's available, whether this is the number of cases and the number of prosecutions that we see, they're absolutely minimal. Um, the poll worker studies that I've done with my colleague Alice Clark at Newcastle University, where we ask the people inside polling stations whether they perceive electoral uh, fraud or personation to have taken place, they're clear that this happened. You look at the surveys of experts, they point in the same direction, uh, and studies actually from other countries as well, uh, where they operate similar systems.
um, personation is not a problem. It makes little sense for someone to try to um, commit electoral fraud in that way, given the risks and given the marginal gain that one uh, per vote could, um, could bring them. So if a voter ID is only in this bill to address the problem of personation, and we do not believe that problem exists, why would this government want to bring in voter ID? What does, this, what does it gain from this? I mean, it's difficult to see um, what it would gain. Um, it's not really for me to, to speak about why they are intending uh, to do this. Um, maybe they think that this is going to increase security in the electoral process, but there isn't a threat that's been shown. Um, to be fair to the government, you know, we have had one overseas international um, observation report, apologies, two, two reports suggest this is, as best practice. And it is the case that voter ID is running in other countries. But, and this is important, it tends to be the case that it's running countries where there is a national identity card uh, and a civil population register where presenting voter ID is much easier for citizens. And that's not the case uh, in the UK. People are unfamiliar with having to uh, present this, this form of identity. And the pilots of voter ID show that many people were unable to present uh, identification or actually refused to present voter ID because they thought that it actually infringed uh, their, their civil liberties. Um, so I, I don't think it's a necessary part of the bill um, and I think it should be withdrawn, but I'm happy to also talk about ways in which it could be improved if the government insists. Will a voter ID shrink the franchise? I'm happy for other colleagues to come in, but um, I mean, I, I can't see how it would in any way strengthen the franchise. It may undermine the franchise. It didn't change who's eligible to vote, but it may introduce practical challenges um, that may prevent people um, from actually cast, casting their ballot. I think I would just add to that it could also undermine electoral integrity in many ways. You know, electoral integrity is is a very broad concept. It's not it's not just about policing who's turning up to vote, and it's about how elections are run. It's about people's faith in the process and and indeed in in the outcomes. And and a, a, an ID scheme, particularly a poorly run ID scheme, could really shake people's faith um, in in the result of the election. If people are prevented, legitimate voters are prevented from voting. That in itself is an electoral integrity issues so so I can see you know if we're looking at election integrity in, in the broad way that we should be that voter ID could really be a threat to that um, can I also add that we've got a big issue in society that a lot of people are talking about about those whose voices are not heard in society and the set the, the lock, lack of trust and integration in our society as a result of that and there are really clear um, there is really clear evidence that um, there are differential demographic impacts on who does have easy access to ID. There's a 24% difference, I think, between um, bl um, black and ethnic minority people with driving licenses and white people. Older people um, are less likely to have ID. Poorer people are less likely to have ID. So there may be unintended or unknown demographic effects of introducing this measure, and it's complicated and it's complex. It makes it harder to vote. Why would we make it harder to vote when what we want is a proper democratic national conversation where we all um, join in and everyone's voices are heard and we debate with one another? Thank you very much. Thank you. David Jones, please. Thank you, uh, Chairman. And I'd like to declare an interest as a former member of the Compliance Committee of Vote Leave. Um, my question is to Dr Garland and then please to uh, Professor James. The government... Uh, has relied on the example uh, of the apparent success of voter ID uh, in Northern Ireland uh, as a, a good reason for introducing a similar system in the rest of the UK. Um, do, do you believe that the uh, position in Northern Ireland uh, is comparable uh, in any way to the uh, position in the rest of the UK at the moment? Dr Garland. Other than the proximity, I, I can't see a comparison here. In, in Northern Ireland, there was a, a problem with personation. In that 1983 election, um, nearly a thousand people turned up at the polling station to find that someone else had cast their vote. There were over 100 prosecutions 
on, on the back of that. So clearly bringing in an ID requirement was a response to a problem that was right there in front of people. But even then, you know, the, the ID that was brought in straight away was not a full photographic model. That was brought in at a, at a much later stage. So I don't think that's a fair comparison to make to the situation we have um, in the rest of the UK at the moment. Professor James? So I think one part of the analogy is important, um, which is that actually photographic identification was introduced uh, in the early 2000s for the first time in Northern Ireland. And you did see during that first election where it, where it was required, uh, people saying that they did not participate in the election because they didn't have uh, the form of identification. It's estimated that this is around 25,000 voters, around 2.3% of the electorate. So if this is, if you're going to draw a lesson from Northern Ireland, then that one uh, that could be drawn. But as Dr. Garland absolutely rightly pointed out, in Northern Ireland, there was a gradual introduction of, of identity requirements. It was um, non-photographic ID to begin with, and then it was photographic identification. What the government seems to be doing here is proposing uh, more to 60 miles an hour in a very, very short period of time. Uh, there's no gradual implementation apart from some very small pilots. It's going to a very um, extreme form of identification requirements in many senses, much, much too quickly. Um, and I think this will lead to people, um, it provides more evidence that people actually may not take part in the election as a result of that. So it will be damaging to electoral integrity. Mr. Dr. Garland, do you have any observations to make on the uh, issue of the impact on uh, voter turnout in Northern Ireland as a consequence of the introduction of voter ID? There was certainly a drop in turnout after the introduction of ID, but of course, you know, th th there are many factors influencing turnout in an election, so I would hesitate to draw a straight comparison, but, but I think a more relevant <clears throat> statistic is, is that the, that um, Professor James has just offered around the number of voters who actually said that they didn't vote because they didn't have the ID. And we did see that also in the U, in the pilots in the local elections. You know, there's a significant number of people did say they didn't, um, it, with the subsequent surveys, that they didn't vote because of the ID requirement. And of course, we know in those pilots that over the two sets of pilots, over a thousand people were unable to cast their vote. So I think as if we're looking for evidence of the impact, let's look at those pilots. You know, more people turned away from voting um, than have ever been accused of personation in, in this period. And if I could just add very briefly, I mean, one thing that is often said is that, well, things are working very well in Northern Ireland. Um, but as far as I'm aware, there hasn't really, since that initial introduction of photographic ID, been a really detailed systematic evaluation of the situation. So I said earlier on, uh, with a colleague, we've done poll worker studies where we ask people in polling stations, you know, what happened, what type of problems have occurred, how many people were unable to vote for some reason. That hasn't been undertaken in Northern Ireland as far as I'm aware. So we don't actually know that people, um, the extent to which people are not voting because of the voter ID requirement. So I think it's a poor lesson to draw um, across in support um, of this bill. So, so there's been no evaluation at all. Of course, there have been several elections since the introduction of, uh, of photo ID there. Not of the sort that I'm talking about, where the best form of evidence is where you actually um, calculate within a polling station, you ask someone to, to tabulate you know, how many people came in and said, uh, I would like to vote, but you found their name was not on the, on the electoral register, so you had to turn them away. Or how many people perhaps were kind of misbehaving within a polling station, um, and therefore, you know, we had to call for a senior person to come in. This is, this, that type of evaluation um, has not been under, under, undertaken as far as I'm aware. Happy to be corrected in, in, in Northern Ireland. Mr. And Stanion I think that is really could new. comment on that. Uh, Mr. Stanion, are you aware of any such evaluation having taken place? No, I would uh, concur with what uh, Professor James says. I'm not aware of any detailed analysis that's been done in Northern Ireland since the uh, photo ID came in. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ronnie Cowan again, please. Yeah, thanks, Mr. To, to Angela. Uh, Kitching in, in, in your capacity as head of external affairs at AIDS UK, uh, you've said that the, the, there could be a significant number of older people may be disenfranchised by the voter ID requirement. Could you please expand on that, or what your concerns are? Yes, absolutely. Um, we are very concerned that the uh, introduction, any kind of introduction of specific um, identification, 
has an impact on older people's ability to participate in uh, everyday community life. Um, if you look at the government's own research on this, which actually excluded the half a million people who live in institutional care, such as care homes or like, sheltered accommodation, um, they were excluded from this research. Um, even then, uh, the government found that 2% of people didn't hold the forms of ID that would be required to vote um, under the elections bill. Um, and for over 70s, uh, that's around 180,000 people. Um, that 6% of over 70s um, would uh, have problems uh, presenting the right kind of ID. They may hold it, but they, they may feel it's not up to date, it's not accurate, they couldn't find it easily. That's half a million people uh, over 70. Um, and about 4% of people aged over 70 said that it would make them less likely to vote, which is about 360,000 people aged over 70. So these are not marginal figures. Um, these are really significant numbers of older people. And to be honest, it's already not particularly easy for a lot of older people to get out to vote. Um, they have mobility problems, they have problems with transport, they have problems physically sometimes accessing um, the ability to vote because of sensory loss issues. Um, they may also have problems if they're in multi-generational households, um, actually managing to get to and from the polling station if they needed to go back to collect uh, another form of ID. They might not have the support of their family members to do it. Or for example, if they're a carer of somebody who cannot be left alone, the idea that they could go out to a town hall, collect a free piece of electoral ID, then go on to a polling site is just absolutely for the fairies. It's just not a feasible way um, of encouraging older people to exercise their rights to vote in person. Um, and anecdotally, although there was no demographic data collected, some of the people who were turned away at the pilot sites were older people um, who then failed to return to, to vote because the process of getting out to vote um, it is difficult for them. I just want to mention one other thing, which is obviously the pandemic at the moment um, also has a significant impact on people's willingness to leave the house. So this proposal coming right at the moment is a huge issue for a lot of older people who wouldn't be comfortable using public transport, going to a crowded place to collect, to have a close interaction with somebody so that they could collect some photo ID. Uh, the ONS say that amongst over 70s, about a quarter of people are either uncomfortable or very uncomfortable leaving the house at the moment. So there, it, it now is not the time to bring in this kind of restriction for older people. Um, and I know that there are similar concerns about availability of ID for um, younger disabled adults who um, are, are obviously very heavily impacted and tend not to hold forms of independent ID themselves. You give me a, you give me a lot of stats there, and my handwriting's not up to this role. Could you, if you got one figure that tells me what number, what percentage of a, of a specific elderly age group you believe would be turned away or, or put off from voting because of this? Well, we think the government's numbers are an underestimate for the reason that I mentioned about excluding care populations. But the government's own estimate says that two percent of people do not hold any of the forms of identification. And that in figures for over 70s is 180,000 over 70s. But I would say your, your kind of confidence measure is somewhere between 180,000 and around half a million people <coughs> who said that they would find it harder to vote as a result of having to present a particular form of ID. Absolutely. And as I say, those figures, we have good reason to believe are a strong underestimate. If you compare them to previous statistics from um, the census, which obviously is a very old set of statistics, but um, around half of older people don't hold uh, a passport or a driving license, and those numbers increase as you get older uh, through the older age groups. Thanks so much. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much indeed. Can we go to Tom Randall, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, just to follow up on Ronnie's point, and uh, as, as, uh, as was mentioned there, the government has proposed uh, a free voter ID card uh, for those who. Uh, uh, for those who might not otherwise have any identification. I just wondered uh, what the panellists thought about how that might, might address that concern about um, um, regarding older people. I think you, you touched on that, Angela Kitching. I don't know if you wanted to make any further remarks on that at all. I suppose just that it, it shouldn't be regarded as an assurance because the people who are affected by this are, by their very nature, difficult to reach. They tend not to be online. They're going to be different. They're unlikely to be able to see advertisements in local areas, 
they're less likely at the moment to be out and about. Uh, often they have caring responsibilities and some people will live in households where, for example, they don't um, run their own utility bills, uh, other people manage them for them. So normal forms of ID that identify that you are who you say you are and you live where you say you live are often not available to the people who don't hold uh, these forms of photo ID. And I just can't see a practical arrangement that will really allow local election officials to get out to reach some of these very hard to reach communities. Um, for example, care home populations um, who may be in and out of hospital will have significant infection control concerns and couldn't reasonably travel to a town hall to have a photograph taken. Uh, they won't hold the right kind of ID. So it, it, I can't really see how this is going to be the solution to that problem for a group of people uh, who are quite difficult to access. Thank you. Um, Helen, Helen Mountfield. Yeah, I, I think another issue is that if you have your photo ID, it imposes an onus on the um, people at polling stations to decide if they think the photo is you, um, which, again, is, is an invidious position to put them in and may um, create problems for some people who are nervous about that sense of being challenged, you know, dark skin photographing less easily, trans people, all sorts of people who may feel, I just don't really want to go and be judged in that way. So, again, I think it just may be a perceptual barrier to participating in the democratic process in a way that we can't really evaluate. And just while I'm here, can I just do a quick supplementary on personation, if I may? Um, in the opening comments, you, um, the panellists said that there was, there was very little evidence base um, for personation. Um, if I was going to go and commit electoral fraud, I would probably go and check the mark register, um, see who doesn't habitually vote, which is a lot of people in council elections, and I'd probably have a lot of people there who I could impersonate, knowing that they wouldn't know that they're the victim of electoral fraud. Because unlike banking fraud, you know, you don't know that you haven't voted if you think you haven't voted. Um, I'm just wondering, are, are the panelists confident that the evidence base for, for issues like personation is, is a reliable one? Happy, happy to speak to that. Um, yes, I mean, we're always looking for new forms of evidence and trying to challenge existing assumptions and always open to, the, to, to new evidence um, coming in. But certainly the evidence at the moment very clearly shows that um, there have been very few cases and the types of evidence there kind of vary. So the poll worker studies, this is asking people within polling stations what, you know, their perceptions of people. And remember, poll workers are often drawn kind of locally, so they may know that people in the local community, they've got the ability um, to report people, um, to find, you know, that the consequences um, are actually very serious. And it's, you know, if you think about the marginal gain, um, if you were to try to get hold of an electoral register uh, and you were then to identify people who you thought were not to go and vote, uh, the marginal gain there would be relatively, relatively small for potentially huge uh, consequences. So it would under, you would need a massive organisation, uh, organised effort in order to rig the election of that, of that sort. If you want to talk about you know, fraud uh, and people not actually deciding the result of the election, then there are other areas where there's a bigger risk, things like social media, uh, mis misinformation and then information that, that's that's posted on, on online and so on. So those are the other areas that are, that are much more important. And I just add also, the government has also introduced um, uh, changes to make the voter registration process much more secure in, in recent years, which it has succeeded in doing. And I think that step, um, you know, has 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 achieved the goal uh, in terms of uh, combating opportunities for fraud. Thank you. But if anyone else wants to comment on that, if not, no. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed, Tom. Um, Rachel Hopkins, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, to Professor Jones, if I may, and then Jess Garland and any others who want to come in. Um, other minority groups have also expressed concerns um, to us regarding potential disenfranchisement, you know, that prevention from being able to vote. So what level of disenfranchisement is likely with the government's proposals in this bill across a range of groups? That's a great question. I mean, I, I think in terms of terminology, disenfranchisement is often kind of used. I think what is clear um, is that from the case of Northern Ireland, that 2.3% of the population um, had additional things they had to do in order to go and cast their ballot, which meant that they didn't in effect um, take part in that election. So, um, you know, scaled up 
Um, that's a, for, for, for a UK parliamentary election, that's something of the order of 1.1 million people. Um, and as we've heard already, um, you know, the government's own research points to how it doesn't kind of fall evenly uh, across the population. We've already heard there about um, the elderly, actually the government's um, own research points to unemployed citizens being less likely to have uh, identification, those uh, with severely limiting disability, uh, as well as those with qualifications. And I think the trans and gender non-conforming individuals are a particularly uh, vulnerable group in, in this process there, there as well, who the government's research shows are much, much less likely to have a form of, form of ID. Um, so the, these are the these are amongst the groups um, that could be adversely affected. But broadly speaking, 2.3% sounds, sounds, sounds like a reasonable expectation. Yes, it's, it's this groups that Toby mentioned there, and then the Electoral Commission research as well backs that up. It's it's um, people who are unemployed, people who are renting from their council, and people who have a disability who are more likely not to have the ID. We also know from the government's research that 42% of those people who don't have ID say they wouldn't apply for the free elector card. So you know that is clearly not going to solve the problems here. And it's also you know it's not just whether people have ID, other people have said, you know, it's actually whether this gives people, um, has a chilling effect, you know, people who are already hesitant to take part in the system might feel like this is just one step too far and might not feel welcome. Um, and, and that's a real concern. I just wanted to pick up on that point about the 2% from the government research, 2% of people not having um, any form of ID. That actually includes unrecognisable ID. If you just have, uh, that's out of date, and unrecognisable IDs allowed. If you say IDs got to be recognisable, that actually increases to 4% of people don't have the right ID, which again is a huge number of people across the population. So, you know, I think that's a legitimate question right now is, are we saying this scheme includes um, unrecognisable photos as well? And again, just picking up on those points made earlier about the pressure put on um, staff in, in the polling stations. Any other comments from the panel? Okay, we've talked about the free ID card, but what else could be done to reduce this likelihood of disenfranchisement? Happy to kick this off. Um, I mean, I set out some ideas in my written evidence. Um, worth saying the ID cards seem to have been important in, in Northern Ireland, uh, potentially is, is lessening the impact that this has. One crucial one is um, looking at introducing a Canadian style vouching system. Um, so what you can do in a polling station in Canada is that if someone doesn't have a form of ID um, then, and their name is on the register, then they can ask someone else who is actually an eligible elector, the name is on, on the register, to kind of vouch for them. And what that means is that the person who does have the form of identification can um, sign an ABADE, um, so you therefore have a, a kind of trail of evidence to ensure that, um, you know, bogus voters are not added to, electric, to um, the rolls. So this has been very effective in Canada. Um, they tried removing it, um, found that actually it was really important um, and therefore reinstated it. So this is a very simple way in which uh, it would be very cost effective to, to do, it would lessen the impact of voter ID. And I really encourage the, um, the committee to, to look at that. Some of the other ways in which other countries do this um, would include provisional ballots. Um, this involves somebody who's not on the election register um, or perhaps doesn't have a form of ID um, still being able to cast a vote, um, but they have to come back at a later stage either to present the necessary evidence um, or perhaps maybe that, that, that vote is allowed to stand unless someone actually uh, contests it. So there's different ways uh, in which you could, you could vary that uh, to, to kind of make it work. This does lead to delays in the results. So, you know, people were wondering why, why are the American presidential election results taking so long to, um, to be published? Um, what, what's the delay? And this is part of the process, which is that if people cast provisional ballots, then you need to get the necessary evidence. And it does create extra work for the administrators. Um, the, the, third, the third thing is just to, to broaden out the, the form of evidence um, and the form of identification that citizens could present. So allow non-photographic identification would be a simple way forward. Um, potentially just allow people just to present their poll cards. People already have their poll cards. Um, 
So these are options. And the fourth thing I would say that is really important, irrespective of this, is to actually uh, legally require some kind of systematic monitoring um, of what happens in polling stations. So you know, if voter ID is introduced, for example, then we have each uh, polling station captures data on how many people asked to vote but couldn't uh, present forms of identification. How many people actually uh, want to vote but they don't have their name on, on the electoral register? There could be a requirement to kind of set up to capture that information so we can kind of see the impact. So we have uh, this evidence. So four things, the key, the, the most obvious and really simple one to do, I think, is the Canadian vouching system. And that would be quite simple to actually introduce in relative terms. Um, although, obviously, we prefer not to go down the voter ID routes altogether. Thanks. Um, Can I just add that yes. um, when I speak to groups locally and when I spoke to people in the pilot sites, their view was that very good local engagement with different groups of people made a huge difference as well. Um, I checked that with MENCAP and with RNIB and they felt similarly that um, if this were to go ahead, it would need really significant local resources to allow people to reach into communities uh, to explain to them the requirements and to enable them to have access to whatever, either their own ID or uh, a locally produced form of ID. Uh, and the only other thing to mention was if we're going to allow government mandated travel passes, then they look very different from place to place. And quite legitimately, somebody may you know, be on the electoral register in one place and hold a travel pass um, that covers a much wider area or from a neighboring place or an expired travel pass from where they lived last year. Um, there's going to need to be an awful lot of training if you're going to use the bus pass as a good example of somebody's uh, identification because they look radically different from place to place. Thank you. And that, that's a lovely segue into my next question for Peter Stanion around you know, what are the practical and cost implications for electoral administrators of implementing voter ID proposals? Uh, effectively unquantifiable in many respects because we don't, I think as been um, mentioned by uh, my, my fellow uh, witnesses, that we don't know the full figures of the numbers that will come forward. We do know or we expect there, there'd be a spike ahead of the a general election, for example, but we also must remember that certainly in England, it will be for local elections and the regional elections that take place as well. It's the election drives registration and therefore will drive. Uh, the need for individuals to, if they don't have access to other forms of, of photo ID. It will be a local authority responsibility, even though it's the electoral registration officer providing that um, service, they are funded by the local authority. So resources um, will need to be provided in, in the appropriate ways. Certainly the bill is quite rightly light on the practicalities because that will come in secondary legislation down the line. but. What are the timescales? In the pilots that were run, uh, photo ID was being issued right up to the day before the actual poll itself. We, we question whether that is practicable in the run up to a parliamentary general election where we could have hundreds coming through the door uh, at the last minute. Um, it's been mentioned by, by others on the panel as well. I mean, what will the process be? What evidence will be required? Um, what will the card look like? Going back to Andrew's previous point with regards to the travel cards, what will the actual ID card uh, look like? And it's those geographical considerations as well, where if, it's, if it is requirement to attend in person, that's reasonably practical in a small district, but places like Wiltshire, Northumberland, more rural areas, that becomes a real challenge for individuals, whether they be from uh, a more elderly population or even just you know, other others in, in, in society. We don't have the idea of the numbers. Um, the other fact to bring into this as well is the pressure it will bring, and has been alluded to, to the polling station staff. We are already struggling to actually staff polling stations to recruit because of the complexity and other things are being layered into the, the process itself. Um, the questions about what is an appropriate ID, we've already got quite a large range. It's almost a manual to check that to make sure it's the right one. Now, is that a permissible type, type of ID on, on its face? We've also got the issues that um, with regards to um, face coverings and about the fact that through the pilots that have taken place, they were all successfully run or superbly administered, but they were small, low scale, and the face coverings issue was not something that really raised uh, a challenge uh, in those particular elections. So yes, provision is in within the legislation. Yes, it will be there as a process, but has that been tested in terms of how does it stop the flows from polling stations? Um, at that time. So it, it really will come down to resources, it comes down to time scales. Um, and I, I sort of certainly um, echo uh, Angela's points with regards to the need to have that local campaigning 
local ID, uh, sorry, local information to make sure people are applying early so we aren't disenfranchising people by actually putting a barrier in their way where they can legitimately be on the electoral register. They've been through that process, but they simply don't have the access to the, uh, the ID because the system hasn't been able to produce that ID for them at the end of the day. So a bit of a non-answer in some respects because there's no figures I can put to that other than the fact that we don't believe, and I think it's certainly uh, uh, Jess has mentioned it, Toby's mentioned it, Andrew's mentioned it, the numbers, we don't know. Is it 2%, 4%, 5%? What will that mean for individual local authorities where there could be pockets of huge pressure, whereas elsewhere there could be limited pressure? It really will depend on the demographics of individual areas. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Toby Jones. Did you want to come in? Sorry, Toby. Yeah, sorry. Um, if I can just add that the academic research does show um, that there has been increasing strain on electoral officials um, in terms of a um, funding. Funding seems to be uh, declining. It's increasingly difficult to get um, funding, and this actually does lead into um, challenges in terms of actually, therefore, some of the kind of extra services that often uh, provided, such as voter out outreach activities, and that tends to be withdrawn back. So we should be very protective of the funding for, uh, for electoral services. But also, obviously, the pandemic, um, I think, is, as, as Peter alluded to, to there, made elections much more difficult uh, to run. Um, one thing here is actually the recruitment of, of, of poll workers you know, who want to be on the, on the front line um, of, of um, administering elections, especially when the workforce tends to be um, older, older voters. And face masks are also really challenging because um, some countries that have um, voter ID requirements, but also requirements for citizens to, to wear face masks in small spaces have this complex and difficult issue. Uh, and they've asked, actually in many cases, asked citizens to remove their mask. Um, so there are kind of health issues there to, to bear in mind. But I think the funding point is, re is really, really central uh, to this. If, if I could just come back just slightly as well to reinforce the, the, the points with regards to the complexity. We're so, so there's this stage concentrating on voter ID. That's not the only thing within the bill that will have significant effects in terms of both the administration by returning officers, registration officers, administrators, but also the pressures being put onto the staff in polling stations, handling the postal ballot papers being the, the classic example, for example. So they're the sorts of issues that, 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 that we have those concerns about that will we'll need to be worked through uh, if, if the, the bill comes through as it stands at the moment. Thank you. And I mean, I was talking very much about the administration and there seems a heck of a lot that you'll need to do in the absence of any firm figures of how much, but also there's that part about the enforcement of any voter ID actually at the polling station that was referred to as well. Any further comments on the level of support that might be needed at that point as well? I think the key element is that, depending on what the secondary says, what the, what the bill says in terms of the detail, it will very much come down to the advice and guidance being given by bodies such as the Electoral Commission as to the sensible approach to be taken. Uh, it was alluded to by one of, one of my, my fellow panel members a second ago, what it will come down to the individual in the station as to whether they agree that as a photo that is of that individual or not. And that becomes a judgment call. That can only be trained. There will be a need to resource up and make sure the correct training is given. But ultimately, when it comes to it, it's still a judgment call made by that individual on the day with that piece of uh, information. And there will be differences of opinion. So all that we can do is make sure that the training, the guidance, the back office support given to everybody involved in the process is, is as rounded and complete as is possible in the circumstances. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, David Jones, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Ms. Mountfield, um, in your view, is the voter ID scheme as outlined in the bill uh, compliant with the ECHR? Well, the, I think there are two relevant provisions in the ECHR. One is the uh, right in Article 3, the first protocol to free and fair elections. So that's a duty on the state to create the structure for free and fair elections and an individual right to participate in them. Um, and the other one is um, Article 14, the duty on the United Kingdom to ensure equal enjoyment of the other rights, so to ensure equal enjoyment of access to the right to vote. Now, um, as to uh, safeguards on free and fair elections, it, I think it's probably too soon to say whether there's a breach of international law. Um, as other witnesses have said, um, other countries do have different systems and there is a 
properly a margin of appreciation that an international court will respect the way that an individual system does things. And there is, I think, a Supreme Court challenge um, un underway. So I I'm, not, I'm not sure um, whether or not there would be said to be a breach of the right to or the duty to create free and fair elections. But I do think there's a real concern about the equal enjoyment provision in view of the statistics which have been introduced about the chilling effect of voter ID on older voters, poorer voters, um, ethnic minorities. Um, and in the absence of any analysis um, suggesting that there is a real risk of um, threat to the integrity of elections because of personation offences, there is, a, I think, a serious, um, a serious risk that this provision might be found to be a disproportionate, um, have a disproportionate effect on access to elections um, and the purported purpose of the measure. And I, I will add, I know this isn't the subject of this uh, session, but I think the removal of the independence of the Electoral Commission is potentially legally problematic too. So, uh, it, it may, I think. Arguably, there are breaches of international law, but I do think that what's very clear is that there are breaches of the standards of um, constitutional propriety and perceived fair play, which are part of the um, electoral game uh, as a result of our own unwritten constitutional standards. As you know, the Joint Committee on Human Rights re recently reported on this, yes. and like you, they didn't come to any firm conclusion uh, as to whether or no. not it would be in breach of the ECHR. Um, they did say that the government should make clear how it plans to mitigate any discriminatory impact upon individual groups. Um, what would you suggest could be done to amend it to put the issue of whether or not it was ECH are compliant beyond doubt? Uh, well, Professor James has given some suggestions. My view would be that this should be time limited in the first instance, and there should be proper provision to analyze the demographic effect of the provisions. So who, who is coming in to vote and then finding that they can't, and are they returning? And is there a differential, um, dif differential effect on the rich, the poor, the northern, the southern, um, the black and the white? Um, because if there is, then there really is a serious legal problem. Um, we do have a duty to um, advance equality of opportunity and participation in public life in the Equality Act 2010. So I would suggest that some kind of monitoring provisions are built in with an opportunity for Parliament to reconsider. And that's what did happen in the Transparency of Lobbying Act in 2014 when the Hodgson report a year later reviewed the operation um, of the Act. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Rachel Hopkins, back to you. Thank you, Chair. And again, uh, to Peter, um, the bill replaces the requirement to have tactile voting devices for voters with sight loss with this wider requirement to provide such equipment as is to enable or make it easier for disabled voters. Now, concerns have been expressed that this new language doesn't require equipment to be provided to allow disabled people to vote independently. So can you just elaborate a bit, uh, what are the implications of this new requirement for electoral administrators? And do you think there is a risk that some disabled people will not be provided with the facil facilities to vote independently? Yeah, the, the tax I voted for the TBD is prescribed currently in law. Um, it does work, but equally it has its limitations. It, you know, it is argued that it doesn't allow individuals to vote independently because there still needs to be the assistance of the staff in the station who are under the secrecy provisions. Um, we actually welcome that flexibility because one of the, diff one of the challenges that's been, been uh, presented by the current legislation is it limits it just to that one option and things have moved on. There are lots of things available and certainly the accessibility to elections working group that, that the Cabinet Office run, there are, technology is moving on all the time and certainly as a result of the, 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 um, the court case that took place a couple of years ago, the judgment laid down was the advice given by Cabinet Office uh, and the Electoral Commission to returning officers was to use the best forms uh, possible in local circumstances. Now, that I think is more helpful in terms of, OK, is it using a, a smartphone? Is it using some other form that's more suitable for that individual, whether that be somebody with vision impairment or any other uh, disability that, that will, will, will help them? The risk to that, clearly, is that the standards might drop and actually they'll be different between different areas. 
So that, although welcoming the flexibility that that brings in, I think there needs to be slightly more um, requirements laid by uh, Electoral Commission in terms of performance standards and the like to make absolutely certain that the best technology, the most appropriate technology solutions for whatever group of, uh, of electors need that assistance is available and presented by return officers to those individuals dependent on the needs in their individual areas. And that goes back to one of the points I think Angela mentioned in terms of the liaison between uh, the third sector groups to make sure that there is an understanding of the pressures that uh, are, need to be addressed within polling stations themselves. So we do, we do welcome it because the restriction is exactly that. It restricts to one that is proven to be pretty good, but not perfect. Are there better ways that restriction by lessening it makes it slightly easier with the risk that does come alongside that? Thank you. So just to, just to clarify, welcome the flexibility because I agree technology and everything's moved forward since you know the previous legislation. But are you saying there does need to be a little bit more clarity around enabling uh, a range of electors, some may be disabled, um, to vote independently? And you'd like to see more clarity on that within the flexibility you've been given? Absolutely. It comes down to, um, through bodies such as the Access to, to Access to Elections Working Group, um, the third sector are the ones who have got better knowledge of the, 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 the progress that's being made in certain areas. By restricting, you, you're not able to use that. By actually using their advice and then through the Electoral Commission's um, guidance and, and, and I would suggest performance standards in many respects, requiring ROs, returning officers, to take account of that in the delivery that they then provide that's appropriate to their individual areas for that individual election. So I hope that that, that, that uh, confirms. Um, you can see Angela Kitchen wants to come in. Thank you. Just to mention that I think we need to be extremely careful about removing the specific provision for the tactile voting device. I don't understand why it couldn't be a both and situation. Um, there are 1.7 million older people with sight loss who are uh, expecting and understanding how they vote at the moment. And the only reason that court case which challenged the access to elections for blind people was able to be brought was because of the specificity that currently exists within the law. And so I, we absolutely agree that it's a great idea to be looking at what additional devices or what additional provision could be made to enable people to vote uh, independently with specific disabilities. But there are real concerns about starting from a provision of removing uh, a very specific tool that's currently there um, and the legal um, uh, precision that there currently is around the understanding of that provision. Because um, as Mr. Stanion says, the risk is that it becomes patchy that you get different provision in different areas and that the law frankly allows for that in a way that prevents disabled people challenging it. Thank you. Thank you. Chair. Thank you. Um, John Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a question to um, Helen Mountfield. We touched upon when you answered my colleague David Jones' questions about um, rights, etc. Should the bill distinguish between emergency and non-urgent proxy votes to protect an individual's rights? Uh, so long as the safeguards around proxy voting are strong enough, I don't see a particular reason to do that. And I do welcome, in the light of an election petition that I was involved in a number of years ago, I do meant welcome the proposal in the bill to limit the number of proxies that any one person can have. I think that's an important safeguard um, against abuse. But I don't immediately see a reason to distinguish between emergency and non-emergency proxies. If a, a family member had two domestic uh, proxy votes and for whatever reason a third member of the family suddenly needed help, you don't think there needs to be an emergency procedure for that? Uh, I, 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 I suppose there could be. I mean, the, 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 or you could simply limit, um, ex slightly expand the number of proxy votes that one could have. I mean, you're unlikely to... It's, it's a... Sort of, it's a marginal situation, I suppose. Um, you could have, you could have, but I think the most important thing is to have a reasonable limit on the number of proxy votes. And I would have thought you know, it could be five or six before you start to um, create problems of abuse. Uh, I mean, the Bordesley Green example was, was hundreds of votes being um, harvested, so that's a very different situation. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, David Jones, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Dr. Garland, the Electoral Reform Society has welcomed the removal of the 15-year limit uh, on overseas 
resident voters. Uh, but it has raised concerns about, to quote, allowing foreign political donations to flood our system. Could you please expand on, on those concerns? Sure, and uh, extension of the franchise is, is often welcome, and we would have liked to see consideration given to extending it to 16 and 17 year olds as well. But in the case of um, removing limits on overseas voting, I think that also we have to consider that also extends the amount of time someone can donate to a political party. You need to be registered in the UK to donate. To donate, so there is a link there um, with how parties are, are funded. And the government has stated in this bill uh, an intention to stop foreign interference in elections, and that surely must also include political foreign donations. And you know, the Committee on Standards and Public Life has has a report with rather excellent recommendations in this area, and I'm sure we'll get on to talking to them later. Later, but I think where money comes from in our system, if we're serious about dealing with political interference, has to be um, a consideration, and we don't see those measures in here. So it's just a flag that that is part of the picture with um, extending the, um, the overseas vote. I find it hard to see how uh, extending uh, the vote to persons who were previously resident in the UK and who are currently resident overseas could actually have the sort of consequence that you just outlined, because they would be registered UK voters entitled to vote in UK elections. Why would that risk exist in those circumstances? It's just a flag that that means that there's a, a different group of people who are able to, to um, donate money into into the UK system. And, yes, and but, I think but, but they would be registered UK voters. They would be legitimately casting their vote in UK elections. Um, that, that surely wouldn't uh, have any effect in terms of donations, because they're, if they're able to vote, then they're surely able to support individual political parties. I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong or illegitimate. I'm saying it's part of the picture of political finance, and I don't see that the, the bigger picture of where money is coming from in our politics is, is really addressed in this bill. Uh, Ms. Brownfield, um, if uh, electoral offences, for example, in relation to donations or whatever, uh, are actually carried out by overseas voters, what power uh, do the UK authorities have to detect infringements and, and then prosecute them? I'm, I'm not an expert on, on extradition and transnational criminal law, but I would have thought the issue would be that rather little. I mean, it would be difficult to um, investigate and difficult to um, police. And I think that um, reinforces um, the point that uh, Garland, Dr. Garland was making a moment ago, um, that we don't really have in this bill clear um, provisions for uh, investigating or pursuing where the money is coming from through the electoral system. The Electoral Commission's powers of investigation are limited. Um, and uh, so this is, um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't help. I mean, it, it, but, but it, I mean, I, 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 I agree that if somebody can vote, then they can donate, and, and we can decide whether or not there's a, a limitation. Would it be fair to say that the difficulty in prosecution is a problem that exists now in relation to those overseas voters who are entitled to vote in, in UK elections? Uh, yes, yes. So and, and, indeed, and indeed part of the problem is that pursuing the source of money as opposed to the recipient of it is, is, is difficult anyway. Which is why um, many people have, uh, including the Commission on Standards in Public Life, have caused for, called for closer safeguards on being able to identify where money comes from in our electoral system. So it's not specifically a problem about overseas voters, in my view. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, going to um, Jackie Doyle Price, please. Uh, thank you. Um, questions now for Peter Stanion, please, um, on the subject of overseas voters still. Um, if the removal of the 15-year limit led to a significant increase in overseas voters, how would that impact on, on electoral administrators? Well, one of the things that we welcome this in, in the bill is the extension for three-year renewal, which will actually take some of the pressures off the, the renewals process. Inevitably, overseas electors' registration is driven by the calling of a general election uh, or a by-election in a particular constituency. So there will always be those pinch points to be running towards an election itself. So the removal of that 15-year rule 
will mean more potentially applications coming in uh, to the process, which then deal with the resources that need to be there to administer those. Disproportionately, it takes an awful lot longer to register overseas electors currently because you're going off to check, are they on that register within the last 15 years? Even with the removal of the 15 year uh, deadline, there's still the first step to check were they on a register, then it will be down to actually uh, taking in the documentary proof, which means a second step in there. And finally, with the attestation route that's being proposed for those who cannot, uh, but, but previously can't demonstrate registration of a resident, they haven't got the evidence to say they were there, but they can confirm through a third source that they were. So the actual removal of that deadline has the potential to increase significantly the pressures in the run up to significant electoral events because of the checking that goes on behind uh, the scenes. It does raise the question whether that's possible within the current electoral timetable. Is it the same for uh, a UK elector having the same deadline as a overseas elector? Because then it comes down to the, 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 the situation where we can get individuals registered. The key point is then how can we ensure they can actually cast their ballot in that particular poll? Uh, because ultimately, postal votes, if they're not on the register, uh, effectively 12 days before the poll, they will not get to the individual and back in, in that sort of time. So there's lots of questions about not just the registration side, but how they participate in the elections itself. It really just, again, comes down to resources and the uh, additional pressures that the potential for additional electors coming in will create as a result of the 15 years going. Are there any particular changes you'd like to see with respect to handling overseas voters uh, that perhaps aren't on the face of the bill? And, and again, you, 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 as you say, you conflate the registration with the actual participation, which is actually the crux of this. And, you know, for, for some of us, there is a real tension between uh, having a, an electoral timetable that deals with those concerns, but yet sustains the public's interest in it. Uh, so, in terms of accommodating overseas voters, we don't really want to be letting that tail wag the dog for an e efficient system. But I would just welcome any suggest practical suggestions as to how we could deal with that. Well, there, there, there's a number of, sort of whether radical solutions or the elements for the committee and, and parliament to determine should overseas electors deadline be sooner to permit the ability to get, you know, if, if, if individuals wish to vote by post, the chance for that ballot vote to get to them and back. Um, we would question that there, there, there may be a, require, a, a suggestion that they, an, an overseas elector, when making their application, confirms the method they're going to vote. Because at the moment we do get applications coming in that don't indicate whether it's in person, by proxy or, or by post. Is it time to consider different ways of, of allowing overseas electors to actually cast their ballot? And there are a couple of things in some of the questions that we've seen around um, you know, it's, it's time there for um, uh, electronic voting or over some, something different to allow a group to participate. Because one of the big frustrations that we have with the current system is that after every single uh, general election, I'm sure you will receive in, in your constituent mailbags, complaints that the individual is on the register, but they've not received their ballot paper in time to cast the ballot. And that's a frustration because the timetables that we're currently working to do not in some instances permit us to get the ballot papers out or to get them. even down to proxy voters for example the understanding the education in the system about an individual may appoint somebody in cambridge but in fact they actually live in oxford but it means they've got to get to that polling station in oxford to vote there's lots of things around the edges as well as the practical things about let's look at timetables let's look at the actual implications on the individuals as a result of the changes thank you just as a quick follow-up to that before we'll go to uh, toby james is really the number of this issue that we are just grafting on new demands onto a system which is very, very old and predates a lot of, you know, change which could accelerate things much quickly, much more quickly? Uh, I didn't interject earlier when, when, with the first question that, that was raised with regards to the, the, the complexity of the electoral process. I concur with the comments that were made by, by my colleagues, but, could, but yes, quite simply, the law that we've got currently is based on 1872 and we've had lots of things grafted onto the top of that. We absolutely believe that the, the whole system should be reviewed in terms of modern elections. This will add a greater complexity as of making sure that the greater complexity coming in doesn't actually provide weaknesses elsewhere. So it is, it's, it's another element of complexity coming in, yes. Thank you. Toby James. Just briefly, by way of support uh, of Peter's comments there, 
Um, with Alastair Clark at Newcastle University, we run an evaluation of the, of the administration of the EU referendum. Uh, and one of the things we, we consistently found was that overseas voters were experiencing just this problem, that the parliamentary timetable was, or the timetable for the referendum was so short, that there wasn't sufficient time for the, the ballot to be sent out to Australia uh, and then be returned in time for that person to actually be able to cast their vote. So without um, some meaningful uh, thought about the actual process and way in which this is going to work, uh, extending the 15 minute is going to pose some particular challenges. Um, E-voting is something which uh, people often suggest. Uh, I think there's lots of concerns about security, um, but maybe for this particular group, that is something that could be considered in the long term. It would take a lot of planning to carefully think through this to actually make that system uh, functionable, because at the moment uh, it's under a lot of, lot of strain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, final questions to this panel all come from David Mundell, please. Thank you. Waiting. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, Helen uh, Mountfield, could I ask you, um, in uh, relation to voting and candidacy rights of EU citizens, as currently drafted, the bill would create two different categories of EU citizen in relation to local elections in England and Northern Ireland, EU citizens with retained rights or qualifying EU citizens. Can you explain the distinction between those two categories for the benefit of the committee? Well, the, I mean, the, 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 the explanation given by the government is that now that we are no longer members of the EU, there's no reason for um, EU citizens to, uh, who don't have retained rights, who didn't require rights to remain here but, um, for the end of the um, transitional period to be able to vote any more than any other nationals who live in local areas. But there is an enormous level of complexity because Irish nationals, Maltese nationals, Cypriot nationals, and some other EU nationals where we have uh, reciprocal voting arrangements, I think Poles and a couple of other countries, will still retain rights to vote. It's, an or it's enormously complex, um, so it doesn't achieve the objective of um, simplifying uh, election law, which is one of the things that the independent expert bodies um, looking at the problems of election law have all called for. But yes, there, I mean, there is a rationale, and it's a rationale around Brexit. But do you think that the approach which the Scottish Government, Welsh Assembly Government have pursued, which is a residency-based uh, approach, uh, in the circumstances would, it, would have been a more simple and straightforward uh, approach? Well, I think this is probably a question for Peter rather than me, but you've done that to be easier. I, um, do I, de I mean, yes, there's going to be, first you're going to have to ask which EU new national are you? Then you're going to have to ask when did you arrive? What is your, you know, what is the nature of your right to be as opposed to your residence? It, it, we've just been talking about the complexity of, of establishing when overseas voters moved away, were they residents um, in a particular electoral area at some point in the past, this is also a, a level of administrative complexity. So I'm saying nothing, obviously there are overseas nationals who cannot vote in even local elections in our system, and that seems to me a, a, a question of a, a, a political judgment, but the, there is a level of complexity here, which seems to be unfortunate. I'll, I'll go to Mr. James before I come to you, Mr. Stanton, because I have another question for you as well. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, it's, it's worth really stressing now that the, the franchise, who is entitled to particip participate in our elections uh, across the United Kingdom, is really the result of lots of historic agreements rather than actually any kind of rationalised uh, system. Um, certainly, I would say that a system based on residency is much, much clearer. Um, it would mean that people who uh, are effectively affected by the outcome of that election, people who actually pay the taxes, people who actually receive the public services uh, would be um, um, much, much, much clearer. Uh, and there's two particular issues here. I think one is that it's going to be increasingly the case that for different types of elections, uh, different voters will be eligible uh, or ineligible. This is going to be really complicated for the administrators, but it's going to be especially confusing for the voters. So from our surveys about what goes on in polling stations on the day, We've already seen examples, for example, of someone perhaps from an EU country trying to vote in a general election, but getting confused about um, whether or not they're eligible, whether or not they should be on, on the electoral register, because they can take part in, um, or they could take part in an EU, um, in sort of local 
uh, elections. Um, and the other thing is that if we can move to a situation that's going to be um, where reciprocal agreements with other countries is going to play a key um, role in who has the uh, entitlement to vote, then there is a potential problem here because this would mean it affects the government of the day, or whatever affiliation of colour that is, could then undertake um, reciprocal arrangements with other countries in order to, if you like, pick countries that are perhaps maybe more likely um, to vote in, in, in that direction. So there has to be really, have to be really careful about um, how we define the franchise and residency is much, much um, clearer and, and a cleaner way of doing this. Could I put the question to you, um, Mr. Stanton, and, pa uh, and perhaps combine it with uh, the question of do you anticipate th that having these different eligibility categories will uh, add extra burdens on those administering elections? Yes, certainly. If I take the, the sort of following up on the point that was being made, I think, yes, certainly, we don't have a view on whether residency is um, more appropriate than nationality. Um, Scotland and Wales have that system and it works successfully. Um, in some respects, as Helen says, it, it, it would be slightly easier on some levels. I think the one thing to flag up, which I think Toby's alluded to, um, is that there are different franchises with different polls taking place. Uh, if the bill as written uh, goes through, there will be even greater complexity for colleagues in Scotland and Wales because of the fact we'll have residency for local government elections in those two, um, two areas, but not for the parliamentary. So they'd run the, the double tier system effectively to ensure that the UK parliamentary, the franchise, you know, you've got the various things going on at different levels, although obviously they can't vote at those elections. But the key point to all of this is really the complexity comes around, not so much about um, the, the different um, categories of uh, identifier, it will come from the application form. The key points are making sure that administrators know which, um, which nationality, which, which nation uh, its citizens are entitled to, to register vote in the, in the UK. Um, they, there's, there's plenty of time to be able to communicate with those individuals, either to, to invite them to register, which is a standard process, or to actually remove them from the register. So there'll be a big task at the beginning about notifying individuals of the fact that they have to be removed from a register uh, because of the non-reciprocal rights or whatever the case may be at that stage. The only other couple of bits around that, it's essential that early information is given to allow for the electron management software systems to update their systems because everything is driven now through the software, polling station registers and bits and pieces like that. And that communication points particularly to electors who have previously voted in a local election in England, for example, not now being entitled to because of the reciprocal arrangements or they've not stepped through, uh, they've, they've not been uh, residing enough to get the settled status ahead of that. So a lot of it's communication. The actual system itself is reasonably straightforward to manage so long as there's enough leading time to make sure system changes are there and communication can be had with those directly affected by the changes. Because they're not insurmountable, because we, I mean, certainly in Scotland, we have significant differences to the franchise for the Scottish Parliament election. Not, not at least 16 and 17 year olds are able to, to vote and a, a EU citizens as was compared to the, the UK um, election franchise. And it doesn't seem to have you know, caused any serious uh, difficulties in, in my experience. No, a lot of the, the, the developments that have taken place now are the, the electoral registers you'll see in polling stations will strike through those who can't vote, whereas previously it was very much a look at the indicator to, to, to determine whether someone, someone can vote or not. It's a very much more easier factual record for the staff uh, on duty uh, in polling stations, so it is not insurmountable in, in that respect. The one thing that I will just very quickly add, if I may, is the importance around candidacy as well. Uh, because the, the, if there is a change to a settled status or whatever the case may be in terms of reciprocal arrangements, we have people being elected for a four-year term of office. It means to be a very clear decision that if a nation is taken on or added off to that particular list, those who've been elected with that nationality either are able to serve their full term of office or it's a truncated. That's a very clear decision made very early in the process. It's not just to do with the electorate itself. Thank you. Um, thank you very much indeed, David. Um, can I um, thank our, our first panel, members of the panel, um, for uh, their insight and uh, sharing their experience and expertise with us. Um, if there's anything further that you wish to draw our attention to, please do uh, write to the committee uh, following um, this session. Uh, but for the meantime, can I thank you all very much indeed for your uh, virtual attendance um, this morning. And